Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Tanya. That was a very flattering introduction. Um, artists, I think we tend to always be looking at uh, what might be wrong with our work or uh, sometimes ourselves, trying to better ourselves so we can be more patient or whatever kind of emotional fundamental that you might be implementing into yourself and your work. Um, one reason that uh, my work looks the way it does is because when I started to draw, um, I actually couldn't. So I kind of relied on things like swirls and little um, mistakes. And as I went on with my work and I discovered digital art and I was kind of training with that, I realized slowly that I was relying on those mistakes and those um, artifacts to make work that I liked. And then soon through kind of educating myself where everybody else did in the, the concept art world and painting, um, I kind of decided I didn't like to do that. And while I was deciding that, I was at a festival uh, and I met a man named Dave Zabosky. Um, if you haven't heard of his work, just Google it. It will make, it will make so much sense of where that I've learned the most spirit that I have from. Dave and I had quite a few Skype sessions and he taught me things like tips on drawing hands or uh, drawing from the spirit. Um, we had some really deep talks that really it was interesting because of all of those, I learned so much. But throughout those sessions, I realized it was just small moments that I learned something and small mo moments that applied to me. And I kind of started to hone in on those small things and then back to the artifacts and the mistakes and realized this is what I love to do is I kind of like to create design through flaw. And that's something that I've kind of grown to believe in uh, philosophically um, and, uh, you know, kind of kind of draw from it. So then when I when I met Dave, he kind of got me interested in Disney. And I studied Disney, and while I was becoming fascinated with the history behind animation and some of what I think is the world's most amazing, I mean, impossibly done and finished uh, work, especially if you ever watch behind the scenes, um, I actually don't remember where I was going with that. Oh, uh, anyway, so I started to study this, and but I still love to do that thing that I was doing, um, which is this. Uh, and I'm going to start going through my pictures now. Um, and I started to implement animation and gesture through spirit, as I call it. It doesn't necessarily mean spiritual. When I say spirit, it just is simply a, a, my way of explaining essence when I talk about spiritual artwork. Um, so I'll go through some of these. Oops, I didn't know I made changes to that. And that's a blank canvas. I didn't do this. I'm, I'm not one of those yet. Uh, so this one, for example, I specifically remember I kind of started with these curtains and they, they came down here and I started to create these flowers and, and the flowers turns into like spirits flying off. And I try to have something that just is an experiment uh, experience for me. And um, I haven't tried too much of the virtual reality stuff yet, but to me, when I look at that kind of thing, um, I, I'm kind of, it looks cool, but I'm kind of bored with it already because because I, I feel like the biggest virtual reality you're going to get is uh, having experience on your paper rather than just trying to create something. Uh, one of my beefs with the digital art industry, I'm going to get rid of this, is um, these are more traditional sketches, is that people think that you have to create concept art or one solid style to be a successful artist. And they're always chasing that thing. And I've been guilty of that when I was learning concept art. But the more I came back to this, the more it, it meant something to me. And that to me was priceless and not anything a contract could quite pay. And so, I, you know, as you can see, I, I just kind of kept doing this. If you watch my last webinar, you know, I didn't realize what I was going through or what I was, what I was learning. Um, a lot of those questions that I was asked then still apply to me today, but I think even on more depthful matter. So um, if you go back and watch that, uh, for me, it was, it was really interesting that it kind of is like part one of my little adventure here. And this is one I actually, I brought in here, but I did this on the iPad with Procreate. Um, and I did this, I, I this was an experiment I did. Um, I hooked the projector up in my room and I kind of just 
sat and enjoyed this across the wall one night doing it with on my iPad and but because it was so big though you know I got to I was essentially this wall like this was going down and over my door um, and you know I got to kind of experience like this and I don't even think I created the body until I created the gesture and I'm going to be going over that uh, kind of what I mean more more by that but you can see kind of there's a movement before there's the form um, and that's kind of a lot of what Dave taught me and Disney taught me is uh, to you know create from gesture two books I actually learned a lot from um, alongside learning from Dave is uh, uh, the drawn to life series and those are pretty incredible because the guy in there uh, Walt man just no I don't remember his name I'll have to give it to Tanya and she can put the books in the hey while you're giving me that can you also give me um, Dave's last name? Uh, Zaboski. That's Z A B O S K I. Okay. Thank you. I consider Dave a true wielder of magic. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to rotate. What do I want to do? No, I'm going to keep my canvas like this. Um, so I kind of combine uh, what I've seen a lot of people do when they're trying to create cool work is they kind of um, they'll and I, I understand what they're trying to do and I've tried to understand okay how can I when I look at people's work I kind of learn from their mistakes how I can avoid being that or doing that um, not you know, some people uh, would critique and I kind of on that person and I kind of could take critiques to look at how I can improve my work where I like it. And one thing I see is people, if they want to create abstraction, they'll draw a face, right? And then, oops, that's really dark. They'll draw a face and they'll complete this face. And you know, they've got the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. But then they start to draw their abstractions on, on top of it. And to me, I, I see they're trying to do something that really is, you know, that's awesome. but I think what they want to do when I see that is create from that abstraction. And that's kind of what I'm, I put my, all the eggs in my basket uh, for. Sorry, I just butchered that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so what I do is I, with the abstraction, um, one thing I studied while I was studying animation is I was studying how nature moved, and there's another Disney book, and I don't remember the name of that one either. Um, but I can give that to Tanya in the end. Uh, it was a pretty big impact because it was kind of talking about how that nature was all the same, and it kind of all acted in the same behavior. It was like it was comparing like uh, the wave of the oceans to um, to like the vines of a tree, and to me, that was that was pretty cool because doing creating from abstraction here, um, I pretty I pretty much rely on that. And so to kind of combine them all, you know, I I just I'm I'm kind of honing in on this this very odd process that I'm not necessarily inventing, but um, uh, how, how would I say it? Fine tuning. I like I like I said, I see people fall in love with the what the spiritual um, process is, but I think they're just doing it backwards. So I can look at that and say, hmm, how can I do this the other way around? Um, as I start to draw here, are there any questions so far? Um, let's see. No, I, you know, this so far, I think we're good. If once you get the name of, the artist. I can also add that into the follow-up email for the webinar. So cool. Everyone... Okay. So, do you always work on the canvas, or do you ever work on layers? And this mm. is from Don Seekmiller. Hey, Don. Well, I'm flattered. Um, so uh, that's a great. That I'm glad you bring that up because one reason that I. Um, I actually start my initial drawing on the bottom layer is because um, that I feel as though when I have layers, 
or in traditional sense, when I have lots of paper stacked on top of each other, I don't take it as seriously. And I don't have that one chance, uh, like using a big Sharpie on the wall, you know, the wall you're not supposed to draw on. Uh, whatever you draw on there, it better be good, you know. Um, and so this working on the bottom layer, uh, to me is kind of, if, if I mess this up down here later, it's the rest of this is gone and I've got to adjust it. And you all know that if you try to adjust something digitally when it's all on one layer, you're just going to get mud at the end. Uh, so it's kind of my way of just, it's keeping a traditional mindset, I should say. But John? Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, I'll just finish with, uh, once that I do that one layer, if I want to make, for example, brighter or like effects that I want to test, I, I might break that rule. And, you know, if I don't like this, I'll, you know, that just kind of, it, that gives me some kind of creative leeway. But for the most part, the drawing is under on the, the bottom layer. Anyways, go ahead. There's a bunch of questions coming in now. So, um, do you always know or do you know what you're drawing right now? Do you have? No, never, but I'm confident that as long as I don't stress about it, I will always come up with something I like. Uh, as long as I have a moment I like, I have noticed that um, I always have a good drawing. We all know that when we sit down in a really good mood, um, we tend to just kind of like, have you ever noticed that uh, when something is funny, when you're watching if like a funny movie or just having a good night with a friend. Um, the funnier things get, the easier it is to think of things that are funny. It's the same thing with art. I think when you go for an inspiring moment, um, you're, you're just going to think of something as long as, that's why I think it's important to get like your coffee and make your desk nice and have an inspirational um, workflow because that to me is a huge part of your success, uh, if, especially if you're like me and rely on intuition. Um, I hope that answers. <laughs> okay, well, we'll see. Um, do you work from negative to positive? Tim is asking. Um, it depends. If I'm doing big sketches, uh, I will just do black and white, or if I'm on Procreate, uh, you know, and sometimes I actually forget to do this. Um, but for the most part, I like to bring the light out of the dark. I feel like my brain works better that way. I did like some extensive testing on it, and I kind of like to be a little, uh, what's the word, superstitious with um, what's good for art. And uh, I noticed that if I were to draw a sphere with a pencil um, on a white canvas, uh, I couldn't do it as well if I did it on a dark canvas and brought the whites out. And I tried that a few times under a few like moods. It's weird. I do weird things like that. So on like a bad day, on a good day, I kind of just, when I thought about it, I tried it. And every single time I just, I just did this better. I thought better that way. So, um, but I will also practice on white paper for the sake of not, go, you know, being too biased towards one thing or uh, just for the sake of practice, really. Okay, fantastic. I think that answered. There was a lot of similar questions coming in. Um, do you recommend drawing vertically or horizontally, or does it just not matter? Oh, it matters. Um, so uh, I, it's funny because when I draw, I'm going to add new lyrics. Oh, you know, I should save this. I'll just save that untitled. Um, when I draw like this, um, typically on a medium tablet, uh, or sketchbook, you know, if you don't have large paper, you've got more leeway to kind of be more, you know, create a splash as I call it. Um, but if you rotate that and make it tall, whoops, it's just, just for the sake of understanding that same page, as soon as I tilt it, I simply have leeway the other way. Uh, so the answer to your question, I suppose, is it depends on what I'm drawing and what kind of, what what I'm inspired to do. Um, a, a lot of times before I actually do this, I'm kind of starting this way, more tight for the sake of I'm drawing in front of you guys. And I know I can. Um, 
But a lot of times what I'll do when I'm just kind of with myself is I take like the smallest pencil and I'll take a dark brush and I'll literally go like this. And then on the next canvas, I will do this and and draw it. Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. If it's for like a commission or something, for sure, I want to do that sketch. Um, I figured with this, you guys wanted to probably see the drawing just come out. And if I can do that, you know, sure. Tons of questions about what drawing tablet are you using? Hmm, another interesting question. These are all great, by the way. Um, so uh, I always dreamed of having the extra large Wacom Intuos, and I got it on a very irrational moment um, uh, called a credit card. And um, I was actually disappointed with it. And then I, I've tried the small and I was disappointed with that, you know, being the opposite. And I've tried the medium and I was disappointed with that. And I think the truth is, is there is no size that is good to draw on. Um, it is a challenge. It's not there to help you. Um, so that being said, uh, I am using a medium Intuos, but I have tried them all, and I guarantee you that it makes no difference. <laughs> Some people are also asking, you know, about the Cintiq. I know that that's very expensive. Not everybody gets to give that a shot. Um, and I don't personally have one, so. Mm, you're missing out. Um, <laughs> uh, so the Cintiqs, you know, I have a iPad with Procreate, and there is a difference when drawing directly on screen or with a tablet. And one thing that I lose, unless that I hold my pencil by the end, that's like the end towards the eraser. One thing that I lose is um, intuition when I'm drawing directly on. Um, but if I'm using like an Intuos where I'm kind of almost treating it, uh, those of you that play video games might understand this, or you might just be able to understand this. Um, playing on a computer, you have the mouse and it's very direct and we can, you know, grandma can click on the Internet Explorer's tab, you know, um, but could grandma shoot something in Halo on the Xbox? Uh, probably not because that those joysticks and stuff, you know, it's more, it's more like a controller. So same thing with the Intuos. Um, you have people that pick it up and uh, they can't uh, control it very well um, first try, and they have to get used to it. Why is that? Because it's not so direct. So uh, the Cintiq is great if you are really a, quite the draftsman, but if you need to rely on intuition for clumps of paint or you know random lines like I do, you probably want um, you probably want an Intuos since it's a lot more intuitive. Uh, and not just Intuos, I just mean the tablet, any tablet without a screen on it to start with. Have you ever used the art pen? Uh, I've wanted to, but I know it would be, it's one of the irrational choices that I would like to make that I haven't had the chance to. <laughs> okay, I get it. It supports, you know, things like full rotation and there was just mm -hmm. a, another question about that. Uh, let's see. And one thing to add to that art pen, if you don't rely on rotation in real life, just don't do it. Sorry, Wacom. Do you have any issues or tricks in moving files between Painter and Procreate? Have you tried that? I haven't implemented it in my workspace. I've thought about it, like going out and sketchbooking. Uh, my girlfriend and I, we go up to uh, the hills around here, Lucky Peak, and we take photos and I'll sketch up there and maybe I'll maybe I'll come down and finish it. But I think uh, the fastest way to do that would be, just be to email yourself the full file and to bring it into Painter. I mean, I think that's, I don't think there's any button, but um, I have thought about kind of combining the two. I just, I get a little impatient. Sorry, I muted myself for a second to oh. respond to some things here. Um, I think we're, the questions come in so fast, sorry. Oh, you're good. <laughs> I start reading and quit talking, let's see. 
Oh, this is an interesting one from Jeremy, and it's one that we hear quite a bit. Um, would what would you think about having Painter on an iPad? Mm, well, um, I have actually made that email myself. <laughs> uh, if Painter was on an iPad, um, I would use that probably in places I shouldn't. Um, the only reason that Painter does not walk with me uh, is because it's on a desktop. Um, when they had Painter Mobile, uh, I was on that thing all day long. I didn't care what I made with it. The, the combining colors and just being, uh, I think the reason that I would be excited that over other ones to add to that answer um, would be that Painter to me it feels it feels the same as it does when I am drawing in a real sketchbook. I have not found that anywhere else yet. Um, so yeah, I would I would I would take that everywhere. Do you ever use reference photos, or is everything from imagination? I try using reference photos, and I think I get more inspired by them. Uh, like to be completely nerdy. Um, National Geographic has some of the most amazing pictures. Um, if if some if somebody's grandma is getting rid of them, you know, send them my way because I just I think the more you appreciate creation kind of life, uh, the more those pictures will just turn your brain wide open. Um, and so sometimes I attempt to get use it for reference, but I'm more inspired by them and they help me to. Uh, I can I can bring that memory up later if it really inspires me uh, in its own way. And if and if you get good at drawing, um, uh, I recommend that you do get good practicing from reference. Because the only reason that I can't is because I have not, and I should. I mean, it's never too late. I should practice uh, practice using reference more, but I I don't currently. I wish I could though. <laughs> This is interesting. John said that AstroPad allows you to use Painter on an iPad. AstroPad? I cannot, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Um, something for me to look into. And then Xander is wondering, what does Painter do for you, for you that Photoshop doesn't besides that natural media feel? Um. Or is that what it's all about, really? It really does come to that natural media feel. Uh, Photoshop is, I mean, don't get me wrong, I still use Photoshop, um, depending on what I'm working on. If I'm working on my Elsewhere graphic novel, I'm in, I'm, in, it, I'm back and forth. Um, I think it depends on what you get used to using. So if you get used to using an airbrush and if you paint with that, I doubt that Painter is going to um, be much of a difference. Uh, but if uh, if you use something like the cover pencil or the scratch board tool or maybe even like the digital oil, you know, unless you go download a custom brush or make it, it's kind of hard to find something that you can, um, as I always put, uh, create your own illusions to, like something that's you. Um, I, when I look around concept art, I, it's all beautiful. Don't get me wrong. Nothing on the concept art industry. It just feels like I'm looking at all the same stuff. Uh, but if you go look at like traditional artists, for example, their work varies because their tools vary and they vary. And um, I don't think painter makes people look the same. I, I do just think that there's, uh, you know, the industry wants and nothing, nothing against them. But uh, typically, the kind of brushes you'll find in Photoshop are kind of built around that. I, I could be um, completely wrong on that, but anyways. All right, Jeremy Sutton has jumped in with a little information about AstroPad, and I guess it turns oh, your cool. iPad into a Cintiq, um, so you can work on your desktop app on the iPad, but you still need the desktop or the laptop with you. So it's not the same kind of mobility that you'd have with the iPad, like your top. I would. Yeah, I would still use that though, because uh, I don't have a Cintiq, but sometimes there is a project I'm working on, like for example, um, the Elsewhere uh, novel that I'm working on, the um, 
story uh, that you featured a while back, that one I, I have to do a lot of my initial sketches on the iPad because I'm at, at that point I'm working very specifically. Okay, Larry has a good question. He's wondering, he's a beginner, and what type of art, people, animals, landscape, etc., should we attempt on our first project? Or I made the assumption, he might not be a beginner, but what is a good first project subject matter? Uh, do something you like. Um, I once got enough guts to uh, email Ian McKaig. Uh, I don't know if... You guys know who that is, but that's the creator of Darth Maul in Star Wars um, and a lot of other things. I just, that's my favorite thing he's done. Uh, he is so famous in the industry. If you don't know who Ian McKaig is, you please research him. Um, anyways, uh, he talked about drawing what you like, and he was actually part of about um, a good part of why that I'm still drawing just the way I like to, you know, and I don't care how big my following is. I'm, I'm happy with what I'm doing. Um, anyways, he, he said to, he, he made this big email about um, drawing what you like. And, it, and once you do it for like six months or something like that, you can go back and see like a glimpse of your soul. And he was comparing it to like asking Brad Pitt, like, you know, what should I have in my portfolio? What should my content be? And it should be Brad Pitt and nothing else uh, was kind of what he was implying. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, Larry's now asking, Should would you recommend that they start with paper and pencil or canvas and brushes before moving to the digital medium? Uh, yes, actually. Um, that is an answer that no like beginner wants to hear. They all want to you know, use the tablet and stuff. Uh, if you want to do start out with a tablet and you want to work with painter up front, um, just make sure you're balancing it with traditional sketching. Because I can't tell you how many times I kind of lose a sense of reality and I'm not able to draw anything for a few reasons. I'm throwing everything away um, because I'm tr I'm treating it digitally instead of having that mindset of uh, balance. And so I'm not able to finish anything. Uh, I don't have a sensitivity for like the line. I'm kind of I don't know how fast or slow to draw, but when you're drawing traditionally, your body kind of gets down a time, like how how fast should I be drawing? Uh, how, how carefully should I be rendering this? Things like that really matter uh, for your mind to get used to. Ronnie is wondering if you can explain more about gesture drawing and what exactly is that? Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Um, actually, it was one thing that as that you were saying that question, I realized, you know what? That was on the list and I haven't even made it there. Um, so I'm so glad that was the question that got asked. So one thing that I do with gesture is, and right now, you know, this is this is kind of demo right now. And you've seen my work. Uh, it's either really random like this or I'll work on something really specific. Um, but this back here was essentially kind of my gesture, like where especially when I'm just studying drawing like this. I do this this here a lot. I don't post probably 80% um, of what I draw because just like this, and I, you know, nobody really likes just the random, um, I don't really know what people like. But uh, anyway, so there's gesture that I was taught and what people are typically taught, and I, I love it. Um, but it's where that you might make a, a motion um, and this is where kind of like that nature and Disney came comes back to my thing. They make a motion. Oh, I can't even, I, I don't even know how to do it like a normal person. Uh, here, maybe if I break this line, there, there's kind of what a gesture can be. Um, and then, so if the, if the model is right here and this is the way they're sitting, sorry, then they're going to make like a gesture, you know, and they're going to start to create from that. Um, that's what I understand of it, and it gets really, you know, advanced and, I don't know, very, in, uh, not intuitional. Hmm. It's kind of something that's hard to explain. Don, if you're still on, maybe you could explain it in the chat. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but the way I kind of took things is that these lines, you know, typically they're like from a pastel or an oil brush or something. I realized they didn't have to be, um, they didn't have to be, logical straight like that 
And I figured what I could start doing is opening it, uh, opening my drawing with a nature gesture. So let's go to this. Uh, and that's actually a bad example because that one was actually kind of more intentional. Let's see here. Unnamed. This one, haha. -ha. So I started with this gesture right here. I actually literally started drawing this kind of in the corner of my room. And I went up here and then I gave it wings. And what has the wings? Oh, a shoulder. And then the shoulder became this. And I created more gesture that kind of came back up here. And I remember I actually had some lines that went up here. And then I, you know, I created, oh, look, there's his hair. And then I could delete this. And um, so it's this gesture that goes along. It's a splash that I create, kind of like being, it sounds corny, but it's just as true as I can say it. Being the water, wind, or or the air, you know, you kind of have to draw as though you are form. And then since I never really know what to create, I kind of create out of that. And, you know, in the end, the butterflies might be carrying it. And it, it's really, it just becomes an amazing, amazing experience. Um, I took a very small airbrush back here to this, and I kind of felt like uh, we know when you're so honed in and you have such a focus for what you love doing i kind of felt like i was kind of up here and drawing back here in the waves you know again this is like my room so this was like my this is my bedroom door and this is my back door goes my porch and uh you know the waves are kind of like going out the door and it, it's really um gesture is important to me for that reason philip is wondering if you can achieve gesture effects using particles and do you ever use them? So uh, just because he is asking, I will say that, um, yes, they are a huge part of some of the spirits in uh, my Elsewhere novel uh, called Winders. And uh, so particles is something I'm working on. Uh, it's just something that I've decided to keep, I mean, for the most part, may maybe, I don't know, maybe my mind will change like it always does about things. Uh, for the most part, it's kind of under wraps right now. Um, but yeah, I do use it in a uh, gesture of light, uh, which is something I'm still kind of honing in on is not just line, but, um, gesture of light and kind of bringing that out and back in. Uh, so I'm attempting it and I'm learning a lot, but, um, I'm getting there. <laughs> do you ever... Okay, I'm going to go back to this. I lost my space here. Um, reinterpret older drawings to develop a, a new theme. Mm, I mean, like, I could. Um, I wouldn't be against it. I've seen people do it. Uh, but I feel like my stuff is, what it is, is it feels like, it really does feel like a moment. Um, so... It's actually, I want a good example of this. Uh, where's my... Wait. Yeah, so for example, this is actually a good example. Uh, I was trying to save this so I could show it to you all. This was a Bic pen study that I did. It won't let me save it, so I can't blow it up in Painter. Um, and yeah, I did this with a pen. Would I re ever reinterpret that? Um, no, because to me, the way that I made this is... Uh, more moment sensational. It's I can't redo this or redo this. I might maybe reattempt the form in some way. Um, uh, that could be a way. Uh, in fact, this one here, I had like five different renditions of because I wanted to show kind of like the the ink kind of bursting out of the pen, kind of in a spirit sense, of doing what it does on my paper. I want to express that. And it, yeah, it took me five or six times to get it down the way I wanted it to. But reinterpreting old work, not so much. Uh, I might go back and add to something. I Like, I don't really like this. I like the idea of it. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, I might I might add to something, but no reinterpretations. And you've been using the cover pencil thus far. Is that your favorite brush? And do you have others that you turn to often? In your um, great question. I recently started using the cover pencil. Um, I was before this, and if you watch the other video or have watched it, uh, let me pull this out. In the in this. Okay, in the pens, I used to use the scratch board tool. 
But what drove me, whoops, what drove me insane about the scratchboard tool, oh, this is 100%, is it left a little pixelated mark if it was on the smallest, I don't remember. Anyways, yeah, whenever I went to print, it did this. Um, and, but and I liked how hard it was, and I still use it to sketch, but I couldn't stand this, so I was looking for something softer, and I ended up with the cover pencil, which was like the same thing, but with a softer edge. So um, this and the digital airbrush, just for lighting things up, one thing I'll do towards the end here. I might throw another, like the uh, like a sponge on there or something, to, it, depending on what, like, oh, this would be cool for this. Um, but I'll take this and I'll kind of light things up where I want it. And that's kind of how I get that glow with a little bit of an overlay. Um, which is why that I work kind of close to what the canvas color is. Because I can do this or I can do it purple if I want to. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it like that big. I kind of just like to very softly touch the lines. Yeah, those are pretty much my, my two. Oh, and I've lost my color. Thank you. Have you ever tried a Surface Pro? No. I've heard great things about them. Um, I would like to, but I haven't. Are we there? We're here. My dog was whining a little, so okay. <laughs> I think um, we've been able to address most of the questions so far. So if you guys have any more, go ahead and put them in the questions panel for me. Yeah, you guys give me the content here. You know, there's a few questions about how you created the dark canvas. I don't know if maybe you can review that for us. Oh, yeah. So that's really easy. Um, you can start a canvas, and if you forget to do this, which I typically do, I click it new, and I click the size, and I hit enter. Um, you know, you can, you can choose the canvas color right here, and uh, you can go throughout these colors, how saturated you want it, how lower saturated you want it. And then what I do is I um, will go how bright I want it from there. And then it's hard to see what the whole canvas is going to look like with that little tiny dab of color. So I'll okay that. But if it, yeah, it looks brighter than I thought it was going to be, then I'll go into effects, tonal control, and I'll actually adjust my colors. This gives me the option to really hone in exactly the color I might want it. And um, to further answer your question, I usually like it pretty, usually pretty dark if I'm going to work from the darkness. And then I'll try to give it some color with saturation and then adjusting it and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's how you select a canvas color and that's how I select mine for those of you that are wondering that too. Tom is wondering how much emphasis do you place on studying anatomy he, he, okay <laughs> uh, um there's never enough uh you'll always learn something you didn't know before i remember the moment that that clicked with me i was specifically learning the nose uh and we all kind of draw the nose like this and then like uh and there are different kinds of noses but there's just this one piece of anatomy i realized like anatomy is never ending and so you have you know, the nostril and this goes down. But I remember realizing that there can sometimes be a bump right here, you know, just a little like cartilage or whatever. I don't actually look at the books. I draw from life when I can and, and again, try to remember. I see pictures and, and you notice those things that you can kind of uh, do in your next drawing. Um, aha, I just turned the dimension on that. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's just little moments like that that, you know, you first you learn the proportion of the nose and then you learn, you know, like where the nostrils go. And that's great for studying anatomy. But then you learn where the cartilage is and then you learn maybe where the bump actually goes. Maybe you're readjusting at this point and then maybe you're learning the ears and how that those can look good if 
the nose and the ears are a certain color or um, it kind of it kind of can go on and on and on um, so yeah there's never-ending anatomy uh, it's I it was something I think it just sucks to say oh yeah I'm studying or I'm a student but as long as you make it fun and do something cool with it um, you're going to enjoy the whole process how do you approach shading in your work Gary is wondering um, a couple of ways uh, so I've typically only bring the lights out but if I want to get really depthful or something if I'm not feeling as lazy as I usually am about it because uh, I, I am I was actually I've just been realizing this um, recently as I'm trying to learn and grow is that some of my work really is lazy I realize like what if I actually wasn't just doing this for the moment of oh this is kind of cool and took my work somewhere um, uh, and when I'm not being lazy with it I realize that I actually will use like a overlay layer um, or I'll just wear airbrush right over it and I'll go darker in areas I want to go darker and then what I can do from there I'll even go darker up here where it's not supposed to go darker just so that later on when I in fact let me just I'll just do this this will just be part of my thing um, then not only am I kind of shading in areas I want to and kind of subtly changing you know because this is this is very um emitted this is pretty uh not exactly shading but then what i can do to hone that in is i'll take it and draw over it so it kind of gives me like another dimension to draw off of there's my virtual reality experience right there <clears throat> Do you ever create animals or creatures? Sometimes. Um, I actually love drawing my dog, Maggie. Uh, I typically kind of animate her because she just makes, she makes funny, fo oh, excuse me, uh, funny faces and um, she's just kind of a, uh, we have a theory that uh, she grew up uh, with a bum um, that lived in my apartment for a while. Uh, Anyways, um, that's about it. I mean, sometimes I'll draw an animal if it, it applies to the picture, but I think I love the portrait a lot. Uh, uh, it's just kind of, there's so much expression and you can get good at it. It's kind of the thing I hone in on. I would like to maybe expand a little more, but I have a theory that if you're going to draw something, um, just like they do at Disney or DreamWorks, uh, they draw that thing a hundred times to learn how it moves before that they go and execute it. And I'm a, Big believer in that. So um, sometimes I'll post a sketch or something, but uh, I am intimidated as well. Do you have favorite anatomy sources to learn from? Mm. Think about it, and I can add them to the follow up. Um, and to be honest, uh, just to say on that one, uh, I would say observe from life. Uh, if you observe from a book, um, which I have a few that teach you how to like draw, you know. Um, but I've found that if I'm looking at a book, I kind of tend to chase the picture more than I do the knowledge. And uh, so that's that's a pretty big deal for me. Uh, just while you're looking at these books, you know, learn, don't um, don't copy. Donna was also wondering if you use live models. Uh, I would like to. Um, I draw my girlfriend a lot asleep, <laughs> um, but uh, I can only do so much with that, you know, put her pillows on um, on the stars or whatever. Uh, I would, I think that would be fun. Um, I draw my son a lot. He's, he's a cool three-year-old model. Do you know what the largest size print that you've made from one of your painter canvases is? Uh, good question. Um, so typically, because of the way that my mind works, uh, I kind of tend to um, put random numbers into the canvas and just make sure that those numbers are a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, like 12,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels, or you know, just kind of putting stuff in there and then like, oh shoot, I actually like this one. 
um, and now I have to figure out how to fit it because somebody wants to buy it. And then, um, so I typically bring it down to one of those like a dollar an inch printers. Um, but I have, I'm just like cut it where it needs cut, I guess. Um, I don't know exactly how big though. I'm not liking that. I think I took that in an odd dimension. Uh, that's another thing I was going to kind of touch on is uh, one thing I've learned this last year is that art is timeless. Um, nobody ever looked at the Mona Lisa and really was like, but did he do that in an hour? You know, um, so one lesson I've been learning is, uh, and actually speaking of drawing from models, I was drawing my um, girlfriend sleeping while that I learned this. Uh, I was drawing her and it, I kind of just like, the composition was good, but it didn't go with the moment. It just didn't make any sense, and none of it really did in the end. <laughs> um, however, uh, I did have this uh, kind of realization that I could erase it, and it didn't matter. You know, like I could, I could. So just like I did with this nose that I'm, you know, butchering. Um, uh, it didn't matter that I had went back an hour, two hours at work. It was really about the experience, and um, I, and then I realized that after that, as I started drawing again, like, oh, this was worth it because now I have the drawing I wanted, at least more than I did it, partway through. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it just it just kind of made me realize that, that you know, if if you want a good drawing, don't be afraid to um, be timeless with your work, and don't care about how much time you put into something. Uh, to be able to back out of it too. What DPI do you work at and do you have a method for printing? Is there a certain medium you use, a service? Mm, uh, to be honest, I typically go down to Office Depot. Um, like that's a, uh, I would like to get into, like there's a guy I know where I work and he knows somebody that does like those prints, but um, I think the hardest part about prints is, for me, is money investment. Uh, I don't typically sell a lot of work, and uh, I think my interest is more in the process, not in the hanging. So um, I haven't sold enough work, I think, to really have that experience. But typically, yeah, just because of that Office Depot. Lorraine is very curious to know how she can imagine and draw a full forward face from a profile. <laughs> oh, you mean like this up here, uh, this top one? I don't know. Let's let's see. I'm thinking head on. Hmm. But um, I'll wait a second to see. And Brian wonders how much time do you practice every week just giving yourself the time to sketch and learn uh, anybody that knows me knows very well that um if i don't draw literally every single day for one two three hours um i actually get really cranky and i am uh, it's not like i'm gonna go and tear somebody's head off or you know, it's not like I say anything. I just, I'm just not really down for anything. Like, I, no, I don't want to come to your party. I have not drawn yet. And uh, um, my girlfriend want to go to things after work. And I'm like, uh, oh, okay. I mean, but I'm like thinking like, oh, shoot, but I didn't, I didn't draw today. So um, I kind of, it's if I don't uh, kind of thing uh, more than how much do I. Uh, but I think think I spend like yeah two three hours um, back to her question she was asking about a full head-on did she clarify that that was before I forget yes a that does mean head-on okay so um, I would there are a lot of people that will learn from classes that I think are wonderful but be careful with the content that you learn from because a lot of people that are teaching are actually teaching because they know like the details, you know, um, you don't 
necessarily always see them out doing it. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some great teachers. I learned a lot from the Schoolism courses. Uh, I recommend you link those as well, Tanya, because if, if you want to learn how to draw, Schoolism is the way to go, no matter what you're studying. Um, anyways, uh, so the reason I say that is because when you're learning to draw a front-on face, you have to um, simplify. Uh, I used to do it by shapes, and I learned like those shapes were too big. Whoops. Um, but it's really a matter of mm, here. This will make sense when I lay it out. It's really a matter of getting your brain to memorize this. Like that's it. And then, like I was saying earlier, studying from life to know where that that little cartilage bump was or where that somebody blushes, you know, that like they blush down the side and gradating up or whatever, um, where their pupils are, um, you know, where is facial recognition? How does Snapchat recognize us? I, you know, those are just modern things you can learn yourself that aren't in a book. Um, and where, how, how much is under the chin? You know, is it, is it a sharp chin? Is it a thin neck? Uh, looking around at life and filling this in. So memorize this, um, and you can do that by just looking up basic face anything. Uh, some of them do vary, but you'll figure it out, and especially as you notice those things. So memorize the pan and then cook your eggs on it, is what I say. <laughs> All right, great. Um, Kathy is wondering, because you work on such a large size canvas, what type of computer are you working on that can handle that? Um, so, I don't really know what kind of computer I'm working on. It's like an HP, um, HP something. It was just like a, this is like your basic Best Buy desktop computer. I would like to work on a laptop, but um, those are expensive. And uh, I think my thing with, that is what computer do you want to run? What type of work are you doing? So for example, if I was to use a brush that was like a full out texture brush and uh, jittering and doing all this cool directional stuff, you might want a faster computer. I don't actually have that fast of a computer. Um, well, I, I do, but just not for those things. Um, where if I'm just using a massive, massive canvas, even on the oldest, oldest MacBook, I can say from experience, you can put it on to painter's maximum size and with a line, the only lag you will get is with moving the canvas, maybe. So uh, it depends on what you wanna do. Um, get one as fast as you want. Uh, uh, there are ones for graphics and they seem to kind of emphasize that on the marketing, but um, for sure the kind of work that I do, it doesn't even matter. Are there any online courses that you recommend? Yes. Um, the ones I was mentioning earlier, the schoolism classes. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the one that I've learned a lot from. Uh, learn Dice Tasumi and uh, Robert Kondo's uh, light classes. And uh, the reason for that is because to know about light and how it works realistically is so essential, I've learned. Uh, there's also that gesture class on there. That is, uh, in fact, historic artist uh, Craig Mullins just put a schoolism class on there, and he was, uh, as far as I know, the first digital painter. Um, so I definitely re recommend learning for that for like $30 a month. All right, and I know we're we're getting close to the top of the hour here. So Tim's question is <laughs> relevant. He says, "When do you know when you're finished with the um, work?" I get bored with it. <laughs> um, I, uh, as you can see, this is like um, it depends on how I'm doing it, and that's actually great because then I can kind of tell you guys, like, hey, I don't actually intend to finish this one. Um, if it's like this, you know, and I'm like, obviously like messed up a little here, but I'm mostly having experience. I started with this wave coming in and it drew these kids and then drew this lady. And I'm essentially, this is like the coolest way of sketchbooking, sketchbooking and learning ever. And you can get better through an experience. Um, now, if it's more solid, like maybe it's one of these, like this, 
Um, I tried to fix this one before sending it to you, and I think I messed it up, all these dark edges. <laughs> um, uh, anyways, um, this has more of a shape to it. So as long as I'm happy with what's like in the shape with solid, illustrative, you know, uh, illustration requires a, a positive shape. This kind of sketching does not have that. That's why it doesn't work for really like a job or, you know, maybe a cool Facebook following. I, I hope to do something with it. Um, but it's not, this is not a financial and illustration requires this shape. So sometimes uh, I will make sure I'm doing something like this if I'm, some, I've, I've been trying to practice my work to get to more of an illustration position with what I've done. Um, but yeah, so it just kind of depends, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. All right. Well, I think for the most part, we've addressed a lot of questions. There is one more um, that I don't know if you have done or not, but Brian was wondering, what's it like to do a collaboration piece? Have you ever worked with other artists on a piece of digital art? Oh, you know, it's funny. I was just talking to Gear Duran um, on the phone the other week, and I've thought about doing one with him um, to send him my line work. And then, you know, as we all know, if you guys know Gear's work, um, some of the coolest airbrushing I've ever seen. So we were going to kind of see, but other than that, um, the only collaboration I have right now is with my friend Alex Stinson, and that is uh, on a project called uh, The Times Elsewhere I'm working on where he is uh, taking over the writing of it and uh, we're doing a graphic novel. But that's all I know about collaboration so far. Uh, if anybody is open to something, I may not have the, may or may not have the time, but um, I would love to send you some line work and see what you know you kind of come up with. Or you can send me yours. All right, fantastic. Well, I, I think this was really great. I'm impressed by your ability to draw, paint, and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's probably... It's very challenging. It's very hard for many artists, and you were really wonderful at answering everybody's questions. Um, Edwin said, can you repeat that airbrush name? I think I missed that. Oh, yeah, it's uh, just the digital airbrush. Um, I do, from time to time, depending, I will... This isn't simple. It's not actually an airbrushes. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I don't know why that it's moved in there. I would like it to be in airbrushes. Um, there's a digital grainy airbrush now, uh, and that one works too. I actually like it for painting um, just because that you can turn the grain on, and then you can also choose how hard it is up here. You can make it soft, or you can go in and make this like, whoops, like a paintbrush, paintbrush like photoshops so again depends on what i'm doing but uh that's uh oh yeah you're just asking what the name of the brush was hey that's so okay maybe. the more information the better <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you so much justin this was great and if you could see the questions panel everybody's saying thank you um Oh, and the airbrush artist, Ethan, is Gear Duran. He's another one of our painter masters. So you can check him out on the masters page. He also has done a webinar. And um, But most importantly, I want to thank Justin for all of his time and tips and fantastic talent today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, guys, and uh, that was awesome. All right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close down the webinar, and we will send you all a follow-up email with the link to the recording on YouTube. And we hope to see you next month. So just check our webinars page to see what's up next. All right, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs>